like to call the April 14th, 2022 meeting of the Burlington Conservation Commission to order. Uh, as everyone can see, we have, uh, we, 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 I will uh, do a roll call because we have some people that are remote. Uh, I and myself as the chair are here present uh, in the meeting room. Uh, with me tonight is our Associate Commissioner, Kent Moffitt. He is present. Uh, Bill Boyvin, you want to call the roll? I agree. All right, All Ed Loturco? Yes, I'm here. Jennifer O'Riordan? Yeah, I'm here. All right, Don Bernstein is absent. Uh, Indra Deb is absent. Okay, uh, John Keeley, our administrator, is out for the day. And Eileen Coleman? Present. Present. Okay. All right, so uh, we will do each of the roll calls by name because we have some people on remote. Uh, and looking at the agenda, uh, Eileen, if I'm correct, number nine, which is 102 R. Wind Street, will be continued until April 28th. That is correct, and so is 98 to 108 Middlesex Turnpike. Okay, so, so for, for, however, for number nine, the continued public hearing of 102 R. Wind Street, uh, could I have a motion to continue that hearing until uh, April 28th? Second? Second. Okay, uh, Bill, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, we have uh, Jennifer, how do you vote? Yes. Ed, how do you vote? Yes. And the chair votes yes, so by a vote of 4 0, zero uh, the 102R Win Street hearing is continued to April 28th. All right. Uh, the, the other thing that's continued is 98108, the request for a certificate of compliance. Middlesex Turnpike, it's the yard house. Uh, it was a stormwater permit and they're asking for their certificate of compliance. We do not, and for that one, we do not, it's not a hearing, so we do not need a vote to continue, I believe. Well, it was a stormwater, uh, it was a full hearing, so. It's not an open hearing now, though. We closed the hearing. Okay, yes, you're right. You are, you are absolutely right. Okay. Yes, yes. All right, so, so uh, we have uh, citizens time. Uh, is there anyone online or, I can see there's no one else in the audience for citizens time. Uh, is there anyone online that would like to say something that's not on the agenda? Okay. okay. Next we have the approval of minutes of March 24th, uh, 2022. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second, Jennifer, but could I ask that there be one edit? Um, in one of the first parts where we were talking about um, honoring Gail, the minutes note me as Mr. O'Riordan. And although my, although my husband does look up to Gail and think she's a great person, it was me who said it. So it just, I think it was just a typo, but that's all. <laughs> in fact, I was going to call for edits, and are there any others beside what Jennifer said? Oh, All right. right. Okay. So there's a there's Sorry a about that. <laughs> there's a motion on the floor to approve the minutes of March 24th, 2022. Uh, Bill, how do you vote? Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Ed. Yes. And the chair votes yes by a vote of four zero zero. The minutes of March 24th, 2022, are approved. Uh, now we're on item number four. We have a discussion of the Community Preservation Act and our featured speaker is uh, Jonathan Sachs. So introduce your name for the record and the floor is yours, sir. And explain in what capacity you're here. Hi, uh, my name is John Sachs and I am the uh, chair of the Citizens Committee for to pass the um, Community Preservation Act in Burlington. This is a citizens committee that consists of people who have interest in different areas that the Community Preservation Act is helpful for, which in particular are open space, recreation, historical preservation, and affordable housing. 
I have a little quick summary here that I'll run through. Um, I thought more people were going to be in person, so we have a handout. But uh, it's pretty much all text-based, so people aren't really missing anything by not having it. I'll hit these bullet items real quickly. Uh, CPA, the Community Preservation Act, was passed in the year 2000 by the Commonwealth to help communities fund areas that enrich the quality of life in a community, specifically open space and recreation, historical preservation, and affordable housing. The idea being that because seemingly more pressing things, such as police, fire, and DPW, generally uh, sometimes squeeze out some of these other areas, the state put together a method by which communities can fund these other areas, but each community gets to choose whether to join the program or not. So what we're trying to do is to ask town meeting this coming May to put, to put CPA on the ballot for the citizens to vote on. Um, so there will be a warrant article that needs a vote in May. The state has been collecting fees on all real estate transactions since the year 2000 uh, to put in a fund which they then give back to those communities that have chosen to join the CPA. Um, what happens is that communities that have chosen to join CPA put a small surcharge on local real estate taxes. The state then adds a match which has been, which can go up and down at the very beginning. It was a 100% match, dollar for dollar. Now, right now, it's around a 40% match. So each dollar that Burlington would raise could get as much as 40% extra from state funds. We estimate that the surcharge will cost the average homeowner in Burlington about $75 per year. Um, and there are exemptions available for low-income people and moderate-income seniors. By the way, CPA, the law, allows member towns to assess a church surcharge anywhere from 1% to 3%. We are suggesting 1.5%, which is the most common amount the towns have chosen. But some have chosen 3%, and some have increased it from 1.5% to 3% because they like the results. It's also possible for any community to leave the program entirely, but no community has ever chosen to do that. 188 current communities representing two-thirds of Massachusetts are members of the CPA program. By the way, commercial properties pay the same rate. Their properties being larger, more expensive, their taxes are higher. We have approached the uh, Burlington Chamber of Commerce and Government Affairs Committee who said that they recognize that the CPA can have a beneficial effect to the town because basically it will improve some of the amenities that would make a difference to a company in deciding where to relocate, particularly open space and recreation, but I think the other areas as well. So the cost isn't too severe and there's a state match. Uh, so the question is, why do we really need it? Well, what we wanted to do is just cover what some other towns have done with their CPA funds. Uh, Hamilton built a town pool, which is a topic that has come up in Burlington. Mattapoisett built a lovely bike path, which another topic that has come up around here. Uh, Barnstable Amherst Bedford restored historical properties. Uh, Tewksbury and Bedford created affordable housing, including for people with disabilities. And on our website, we have a nice example where Arlington turned an old playground into a modern, attractive, safe play space. What are some things that could, uh, specifically where uh, Burlington could benefit? We see ADA accessible trails, which we don't have now. There are places where there uh, let's say at some entrances to Mill Pond, there's only three parking spots. It would be nice if there was more parking at certain conservation areas. Uh, there are some beautiful wetlands through town where there could be gorgeous boardwalks that take you through them. Um, we, 
periodically hear that some of the playgrounds in town uh, could use some improvement. CPA money can definitely pay for that, along with things like a swimming facility. Uh, historical preservation is a major area. We have seen a number of historical properties uh, be torn down that the Historical Society and the Historical Commission and citizens would like to have kept, but there was simply no funds. CPA can specifically provide funds for preserving historical buildings. And affordable housing for older adults, for veterans who want to remain in Burlington is another one of the three very specific targeted areas for CPA. So what would happen is that if Burlington First, the town meeting says yes, this goes on the ballot in November. And if the public says yes and it passes, then a town CPA committee will be formed with up to nine members. Five are prescribed by the law. They are people from Recreation Commission, Conservation, this commission, Historical Commission, Housing, and the Planning Board. And then there's four optional members that can be appointed by, from the community, by the Board of Selectmen and or their town moderator. Um, once it passes, community members and groups can submit proposals to this CPA committee, which will select the best and submit those back to town meeting. So in the end, every expenditure, every project will have to be approved by town meeting. So what we're looking for uh, going into town meeting is to get the approval as many important groups and committees as possible, and the Conservation uh, Commission is one of those groups that we would like to be able to say that we have the support of CONSCOM going into the town meeting. Uh, the summary is very simple. It is the fact that we already pay into it, and uh, we won't get that money back unless we join. Uh, it's not terribly expensive, um, and really all we're asking for in May is to let the voters decide. So, uh, by the way, uh, there is, uh, we have a website, yescpaburlington.org, although today I did get an email from somebody whose accountant had retired and he was looking for help. I did explain that we're not that kind of CPA. Uh, there's also a communitypreservation.org website that is of the, uh, the coalition that is in support of the overall statewide project, and their website is an absolute goldmine of information about what every town has done with their CPA funds. You, if you're interested, you can find out all kinds of wonderful things on that website. So, are there any questions? All right, so let's have a, a little bit of time for discussion. Uh, I would urge anybody online, if you have questions or you want to emphasize a particular point that you think is important, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, so uh, why don't I, uh, uh, Kent, why don't I just start with you? You have any comments or how does it sound to you or? Um, um, I mean, it, I think it sounds like a really good idea. I mean, the open spaces piece and the recreation, historical stuff, sort of like it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good program. It's the first I've ever heard of it, so. Um, I think it's a pretty neat thing. I think the summary that you had about what other towns have done is, you know, pretty, you know, spread across, like you said, like parking, conservation, you know, Arlington did a <coughs> new playground. You know, so, and I think within this town, I think this is probably a lot of stuff that could be used um, from something like this. So I think it sounds like a really good idea. Okay. Uh, let's, Jennifer. Uh, yes. Would you like to comment, please? Sure. Um, I'm a huge fan of this program. I think uh, you guys have done a fantastic job of outreaching to the community about this and putting um, all the great information out there about this. Um, and I'm really hoping that it that it goes through and that the town makes a, a good decision to vote for this uh, in the election as well. So thank you uh, for all the work that you guys have done on this. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to depart and from normal procedure, which is go around to all the commissioners. I see Andrea, you have your hand up. Would you like to uh, contribute to this discussion, please? Or a question? I want to thank John Zach 
for all his efforts, um, he took over from the group that was previous to this, um, trying to save Mary Cummings Park and a lot of things. Um, my biggest issue has been there's no parking at the conservation areas. When I asked, they said, well, if we open up the road like Sawmill Brook, it becomes a party pit for the high school kids. So there's vandalism, there's, you know, all kinds of problems. Um, we would like parking for reasonable citizens to be able to go to areas. That's all. Okay. Well, uh, the beauty of this program is because there is a state match. Uh, so if we were spending, uh, say, $100,000 to make some parking spaces at a particular conservation area, it really would cost out of town money, town taxes, $70,000 because roughly 30,000 or a little more would actually come from the state match of those funds that are given to Community Preservation Act communities every November. Uh, and the last, the percentage match of those funds last year was 40%. And that includes uh, the money collected at the Registry of Deeds that everyone pays into when you do any transaction. And it includes any additional monies that the state legislature uh, contributes. Uh, when they have surplus funds, they put additional money into the CPA trust fund. Now, the match this year hasn't been announced uh, there's, well, there's been a 35% match that has been announced this year, but that's without calculating any additional funds that the legislature might put in. The le legislature, the state legislature, has been very inclined to support this program, okay? Because, of course, most, many of them come from communities that benefit from it. So they would like to see a, as high a match as possible because it goes directly back to their communities. So... Uh, we're at least at 35% this coming November, and it, when there's a match, it may even be higher. Uh, okay, let's uh, move on. Uh, Ed, would you have some comments? Ed, you're muted. You're muted, Ed. I'd like to thank John for the time that he's taken to present this. Uh, it's an ongoing effort, um, originally part of that first uh organization that was looking into this so i have a great feeling for uh what successful has happened in other towns and uh, basically meeting those town needs and burlington should clearly be one of those towns in the future that can look forward to this so eloquent presentation and i appreciate the time john thank you all right bill uh, that was a good summary and as a conservation commissioner, I look at this program as an opportunity to perhaps protect some of the few remaining undeveloped lots in town that particularly those that might abut conservation land or contain some wetland resource areas. Um, those now are the last few that people are trying to develop and we've seen several in the last year. So with the conservation, I mean, with the CPA funds, we would be able to perhaps even purchase some, some of those properties and protect them in perpetuity, which is part of the goal of the Conservation Commission. Uh, individually, personally, I think that the uh, funding for affordable housing is sorely lacking in Burlington. Uh, and my definition of affordable housing is trying to create a way to allow starter homes to exist you know for people who don't have enough money to buy a million dollar house and for seniors who want to downsize and yet don't want to leave burlington those type of homes now don't exist because if they do exist they're bid outbid by developers and they're torn down so that kind of affordable housing can be uh, uh, can be uh, assisted with this program you know there have actually been communities that use CPA funds to buy a single family home and then renovate it and define it as affordable housing and sell it by lottery to a qualified family and main it, maintain it in perpetuity uh, by deed restrictions. 
So things like that can be done with it that I, I am strongly in favor of for this community. And I see it as a real need. Uh, historical preservation is another area that talk to the people in town who do uh, actively participate in historical preservation and they see a, a, a lack of community support uh, financially for the amount of work that needs to be done. So I, I think it's a program that would benefit the community. Uh, and the fact that John pointed out that 188 communities have been in it since 2000 uh, or later and none of them have ever opted to drop out is just to me a, 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 a a bright light of uh, support that these communities see. And uh, so I don't think it's a bad thing at all. Okay. Uh, is there is anyone there else any online or in the audience that would like to comment on the initiative to bring the Community Preservation Act to Burlington? Yes, Andrea. Uh, ditto everything Bill just said more eloquently than I could ever have come up with. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you, Bernabachi, Andrea. That's nice of you to say that. I just had a follow-up question. What? I just had a follow-up question. It, this is, seems like a really fantastic thing. What? What's the? If 100, 188 other communities have been in it since 2000, what's the? Why is the? What's been the delay, or I guess from Burlington going? Well, in? each community has to vote on it, oh, okay. and pass it, and it has been. Um, it, it, well, it was once uh, voted down in Burlington. I think it wasn't voted out of the polls. I think it was, it was voted down voted, at town it was meeting. Never, it never got to town meeting. Never, oh, never got to town meeting. No. Okay. No. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there have been communities that voted it down. It was voted down in, uh, in, in Woburn, but there was a very expensive uh, campaign against it by an extremely well-heeled uh, developer. So. Okay, well, I mean, here's the thing. First of all, if you have a modest house in Burlington, people will be concerned that it is a surtax. Mm. You're going to pay, you would be asked to pay an additional 70, uh, asked to pay an additional $75 per year. So $16, eight, maybe $18 more per quarter, something like that. And for some people, for who have a small home and whatever, that may be uh, significant. Every dollar may count and so forth. So it's worth emphasizing that there are exemptions. If you are a single person and you own a home, or say a $600,000 home, your tax would be $75, but you can file a form and waive it each year. You don't have to pay it if you make less than about $67,000, $68,000 a year. If you live as a couple, two people in a place, you can, your, the income limit is $89,000 a year. What does that mean? So if you have a, an income that is less than $89,000 a year, you would just simply fill in the form every year, and if you did not want to pay it, you can just waive it and you would not have to pay it. So it's, the program is sensitive to the people who can least afford it because they can waive it. The other aspect of the program that I'm familiar with is that the kinds of projects that CPA funds can fund, the kinds of projects that normally would also not come out of the normal operating expenses. You know, when we spend 20,000 for better lighting at a field or 30,000, that can come out of, that can be funded as part of the normal annual appropriation as a small capital project. However, a new swimming pool, a million dollar swimming pool, is not something that is easily put into the annual budget. So a million dollar swimming pool, if you used all of CPA funds, would cost us 650, 700,000, and the other 350,000 would come from the state if we wanted it, if we elected to do that kind of a project. If we wanted to have a bike path, so people from the Minuteman bike path could bike all the way up to Third Avenue. But so many people actually are using bikes to, during half decent weather to go to work. They, we could have a bike path. That would not be an inexpensive item. And the beauty of that, what community has done for the large projects that are typically not easily funded by the normal budgeting process, they use CPA funds as seed money or that contribution when they apply for grants. 
a requirement of grants is that the town must participate. CPA funds can be the leverage, the funds that can be that you can use to participate in satisfying grant requirements. And so oftentimes the CPA, whether it's partial bonding or a grant money from the state or the feds, CPA becomes the leverage that enables those other two things to often happen. Yes. I just wanted to mention that for uh, viewers at home or members of the commission, uh, there is a video, a six minute video that we created. Uh, if you go to yescpaburlington.org, and there's a link there that says video. It's yes, it's, it's it, the link is yes, cpaburlington.org <laughs> yes cpaburlington.org and then slash video but if you go to the home page uh there's a button that says video and you can just click the button and the video is nice and short right yeah Very there's important. a lot of more complex ins and outs about cpa things like the fact that all three of the key areas need to be funded to some extent uh, you can't ignore one of the three areas. There's a lot of little details like that, uh, but we didn't want to get into some of that complexity because it can get a little mind-numbing because it's a state law and it's very, you know, there are complexities to it. But the basic idea is areas that don't typically get funded can get funded. Well, let's say, let's take an example. Let's say we wanted a boardwalk through the aquifer area. Mm. The town does not have to spend the majority of the CPA funds each year. You still get the state match. Right. And those funds can be set aside for that one big project that people agree on they would like to do, if that's the case. So the, the funds do not have to be spent in order to get the check in November from the state as the state matching funds. It's, it's important to know that. We get the money every year, and we can stockpile it to a degree until we have the money to do a larger project, which gives us great flexibility. And the state basically has no say-so on what we do with the money. That's completely up to the local CPA committee and then town meeting, what actually, where we actually spend the money. Within the guidelines of the law, there are clearly things that you cannot do uh, with CPA money because it's just not appropriate. But within the guidelines, this, the town gets to decide. And also the state can, it is town money, it's in town accounts, and the state does not have any claim to the money under any circumstance. Right. So we just like to ask if we could for a vote of support from the commission, is that reasonable? That would be a reasonable request. Okay. So? Okay, so uh, does anyone on the commission have any further discussion before I call for a vote? All right, could I have a motion to show the uh, preference of the committee to endorse uh, the warrant article uh, at town meeting, which will ask town meeting to allow the voters of Burlington in November to decide whether to become a CPA community. That's what the warrant article is asking. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved, Bill. Second. Second All right, any okay. further discussion or points to be made? All right, Ed, how do you vote? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Bill? Yes. The chair votes yes by a vote of 400. The Warren article going to town meeting to ask town meeting to allow the community to vote whether or not to become a CPA community has been endorsed. Thank you all very much. See you at town meeting on the 9th or perhaps a succeeding day. <laughs> all right, Thanks, John. John, thank you very much. Okay, bye you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, we'll skip down to a request for number six, a request for determination of applicability. Notice is given that the Conservation Commission will hold a public meeting during which time we have a uh, will act upon a request for determination of applicability filed by Ryan Schneider.
The Commission will take information related to the proposed construction of a deck within bordering land subject to flooding. It's located at 7 Spring Valley Road. After we hear the information, the Commission will thereafter issue a determination of applicability. The application is being heard under the State Wetlands Protection Act in Burlington's bylaw, Article 14. And anyone may get a copy of the application by emailing conservation at burlington.org. Okay, so do we have uh, someone here representing Seven Spring Valley Road? <coughs> yep, I, I'm here. I'm Ryan Schneider. All right. Yeah, so you are the owner at Seven Spring Valley Road, correct? That's true. Yep. Okay, so the way we do it, it's very simple. Uh, since you're uh, our since guest, you're... you get to talk first. You can say, it's a, you give a summary, you can say as much or as little as you would like, uh, and then we'll ask a few questions and then we'll just come to a decision. Sure, thank you. Sure. Uh, so, so basically we, uh, we moved into the house about a, a year and a half ago and um, we, uh, we have a large backyard, wanted to um, have a, a deck constructed off the back of the house um, we recently did a renovation of the kitchen, um, and we have uh, a sliding door that will go out to the back uh, deck, and um, it's going to be about 16 feet by 16 feet to match the uh, the edge of the patio that's in the back already, um, and it will be about 29 or 30 feet from the uh, neighboring um, border uh, for the adjacent property. So I know the commission came out or representatives from the commission came out yesterday to check it out. And um, yeah, we had a little discussion then. So, okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Eileen, any comments for the commission? Um, so uh, just to show you, the, the, this is the reason why it is, uh, it, it came before us because Seven Spring Valley happens to be firmly in the flood zone. And that means that um, it's jurisdictional for us because that's considered bordering land subject to flooding. So as Ryan described, um, this is a pretty small project. We're talking about a 16 foot by 16 foot deck with um, six uh, footings, um, six concrete footings are gonna be 16 inches wide. I don't personally feel that th this, is, this is gonna be an issue in the floodplain. It's a de minimis filling. Do we need a vote to call it de minimis? Um, I've, we described it as that on the, on the determination that we drafted, so I would think that once, that once you, if, if you vote to accept the, 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 the draft, then that'll be the same as accepting it's de minimis. Great, thank you. All right, let's go around and see who has, if there's any comments. Kent? I'm just curious, what's going underneath the deck? Are you putting a slat, like cement, or is it going to be gravel? You're going to put gravel underneath it, but the, the, Posts will be um, in the ground with cement pillars. Okay. So you're pretty much going to rip up whatever concrete's there underneath where the deck, and that's going to be replaced. You should have explained it's lawn at the moment. Oh, it's lawn. Okay, lawn. Okay. Yeah, there's like a little garden underneath there right now. So we're going to um, transplant some of the the plants that were there in other areas of the yard, and um, and dig the holes as necessary. Okay. Okay, Ed. Anything? No, nothing to add. I thought it was a. Um, it's a small project. Um, beautiful backyard, um, and just wish you well with it. All right. How about Jennifer? Anything further? Nope. I don't have anything further to add. All right, Bill. Comments, please. Uh, no, the um, the volume that's actually going to be consumed by the the cement posts is not gonna be significant uh, flood storage impact. So I think it, the, the, the de minimis classification is entirely correct. Uh, so this should have no real problems as far as the floodplain concerns. I'm, I'm, I think it's fine. I'm, I'm sharing, I'm sharing what it looks like now, and I'll just apologize because I put the wrong address on there. I also went to 7 September late yesterday. <laughs> and Sorry about that. Okay, uh, I agree. I think uh, the uh, uh, the volume taken up by the six pillars is de minimis, so I don't see an issue as well. I agree with that. Uh, is there anyone online or in the audience 
that has a question about the application for a deck at 7 Spring Valley Road. Okay, hearing none, we have a draft decision, which is a negative conditional deci decision. We'll review it and then vote on it. And it essentially means if you adhere to a few general precautions, which are kind of normal for this kind of a project, that the commission is saying that they believe no impact on the floodplain. So uh, would you do the review, please? Sure, okay. Uh, so this is a project at Seven Spring Valley Road. Um, the plan is just a depiction of the deck superimposed on the GIS map and aerial. Uh, applicant proposed to construct a 16 by 16 foot deck off the rear first floor of the existing house and the work was in bordering land subject to flooding, also known as the 100 year floodplain. The commission is finding that the amount of BLSF fill, that's flood displacement from six sonnet, sonnet tubes would be de minimis and will not cause an increase nor will contribute incrementally to an increase in the horizontal extent and level of flood waters during peak flow. The deck itself will be above the flood elevation. Uh, the Commission is voting to issue a negative determination as, as we, uh, this will just be for the project as described above. Um, all construction materials and excavated soil should be disposed of off-site in a legal manner. No stockpiling, no stockpiling of soil or other materials. No tracking of sediments into the public roadway shall be allowed. In the event tracking does occur, sediments shall be swept from the roadway daily. Uh, we are not requiring erosion controls in this case because it's just a very small deck project. Uh, there shall be no filling or grading of the property under this decision. All existing drainage patterns shall be maintained and this project shall not increase the rate or volume of runoff nor cause storm, flood or storm damage to abutters or the property of others. And the last two um, uh, uh, conditions are just about um, the, commission, the commission or a representative has the right to enter upon the premises just to check that it's, it's going correctly and non-compliance can uh, result in penalties. All right, Mr. Schneider, do you have any questions at this point? I, I do have one. Um, yeah. If, as, as many projects go, if, if there are changes that are needed for wh whatever reason, um, do I come back to the commission for approval? Say I needed a, a, a seventh call. Typically, you the call should call be to the office. They would tell you they, they are our administrator and assistant administrator use some discretion to determine whether it's de minimis. If you had to come back, uh, they would tell you if it was significant enough, but uh, you, you may, if there's a change, you may be able to dispose of it with simply a call to the office. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. I appreciate it. All right. All right. So, so uh, if there's nothing further, could I have a motion to issue a negative conditional determination for the debt project at Seven Spring Valley Road under Burlington Bylaw Article 14 in the State Wellness Protection Act? So moved, dude. Second. Second, Bill. Bill, how do you vote? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Ed? Yes. And the chair votes yes, so by a vote of 4-0-0, a negative conditional determination for the project at Seven Spring Valley Road is approved. Good luck with your deck. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right, uh, thanks for logging on. Have a good night. You too. Sure. All right, so let's, we can move on now. Uh, the next is a public hearing. We have notices given that a town of Burlington Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing during which time we'll take all information related to a notice of intent. Uh, filed for 10 Scott Ave uh, by Robert W. Murray. Uh, I guess it's 10 Scott Ave LLC is the name of the company proposing this for the demolition of a dwelling and construction of a new dwelling at 10 Scott Ave, lot number two in Burlington. The proposed work would be within the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetative wetlands pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 131, Section 40 and Burlington Bylaw Article 14. The commission is reviewing all information relative to the application and may issue an order of conditions or in a Burlington wetland permit for this project. The application uh, link is available online at the Conservation Commission's website, and you can get all the information by clicking on that link. Okay, so uh, we have some folks here. Could you first uh, introduce yourselves? Uh, uh, good, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yep. 
Okay, this is Mary Trudeau, and I'm representing the applicant this evening. I'm his wetlands consultant. With me is David Romero, who is also on the call. He is the project engineer for the 10 Scott Road project. And I believe that Phyllis Etzel is in the meeting room with you. So we are a hybrid team this evening. Uh, she must be hiding. No, uh, she, she, she actually just walked in. Did she? Her timing is impeccable as always. Wow. Boy, boy uh, was that co it was <laughs> clearly coordinated. She, she said, I she believe said, I Phyllis believe is in the meeting room and in she walks. I'm sorry, Marie Lincoln. Oh, damn. Oh, sorry yes. about that. That's why I'm here late. Sorry. You're not late. We just started. That's fine. Okay. Uh, did you, are you done with the introductions? Mr. Trudeau? Yes. Okay. 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 Yes. 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 Yes, I've introduced our team and I was going to give a brief introduction of the project to the commission. And if Eileen would post the plan, that would be very Do helpful. There we go. Um, as Larry noted, this is a project that consists of the demolition of an existing camp style home on the lot known as lot 2 10 Scott Road. The property is a corner lot that um, has frontage on Scott Road, but also has contact with Murray Drive to the south, I believe. Um, the project that we have proposed for you this evening includes the demolition of the existing house and the subsequent reconstruction of a new single family dwelling on the property. The demolition would include both the existing house and much of the existing impervious pavement. If you look to the top of your screen, you can see that there's a, a very large driveway um, on this property and that will be pulled up as well as part of this project. Other work that we have included in the notice of intent includes the removal of a multitude of brush piles and debris, including car parts and mechanical pieces of something um, that have currently been deposited along what is shown as a stone wall on this site plan. You can see it there. There's Eileen's um, pointer. Um, we have no intention of turning this into a park-like area because portions of the debris fall within the zero to 25 foot buffer zone as well as the 100 foot jurisdictional buffer zone but we feel that the piles are not only unsightly but unclean and we would like to reduce them the project as proposed is setting the existing house approximately 50 feet from the edge of the wetlands the wetlands on this property uh, while they look like a small pocket of wetlands on your site plan are actually considered bordering vegetated wetlands. There's a small stream that comes into this site from the west. It looks like it may be related to a sump pump or drainage on an adjacent property, but there is also a culvert that allows these flows to discharge beneath um, Murray Drive. So this would be considered a bordering vegetated wetland as there are flows through the system of veget wetlands vegetation. The dashed line on your property, um, which is labeled limit of lawn, shows the extent of the lawn area proposed for this dwelling. Uh, we have maintained the 25 foot no disturb zone at the closest point and much of the lawn area um, is much further than that from the flagged edge of wetlands. This project has several mitigating factors. Um, the most important probably is the use of stormwater infiltration system for the management of stormwater runoff. The current house has no stormwater management because it was built ages and ages ago and has had very little improvements made to it. So this proposed dwelling will have roof leaders that connect the roof runoff to these infiltration systems, mitigating for the increases in impervious surfaces, um, which actually represents a fairly good sized improvement over the existing site conditions. When we were out on the site this week, we discussed the limit of tree clearing that had been proposed for this project. 
um, and it was agreed that the line that we have shown on this plan is probably a little more extensive than needs to be, particularly at the southeast corner of the lot. In the southeast corner of the lot, there are several um, large trees, in particular a twin maple, it was probably like a 24 inch twin maple, um, and a 12 inch white pine that are currently showed within the clearing line, but will be retained as part of this project after our discussion with the commission members. Um, we will have these trees marked so they are not accidentally cut, but they will improve the um, retention of shade characteristics on the site and also provide some visual buffer for this future homeowner from the commercial properties located further to the south. Uh, David Romero is with me this evening, and he can answer and describe better the stormwater management system that he has developed for this property. So I'm going to turn in this discussion over to him. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, so um, the impervious surface right now on site uh, is you can see the existing house there in the driveway. So we're actually, it's a very minimal increase in impervious surface. Uh, but with the, the fact that we're going to infiltrate the whole roof, we're really minimizing um, stormwater off the site. And we're also going to pick up the driveway with a stone trench uh, so that all the flow will go into that off the pavement. So for the most part, the runoff on this site will be will be reduced uh, off the property. Um, we did do two test pits on site. They were, as, we're, as we would normally find, we found groundwater about four feet down. Uh, but it's all as it's as remarkable that in Burlington I find so many sites with beautiful sand and gravels, and again here at this site too, it's uh, very sandy soil, uh, so it's uh, excellent for uh, very conducive for this type of uh, application, um, and so that's about it. Uh, really, again, it's an improvement I think for runoff, and um, again we're matching the impervious cover and but reducing runoff off the site. Okay, Any, anything further from you folks? You're all set? Yeah, I think we'd like questions if you have any. Sure, sure. All right. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, Eileen, some comments for the commission. Um, uh, well, I think Mary and David did an excellent job describing what's happening. It's a very tiny existing house. It, the, the new one is, that they're putting up is going to be bigger. They are proposing to infiltrate the stormwater. Um, the, um, the limit of lawn is also certainly going to be more extensive than is there now because there's really quite a lot of trees on the site. They're definitely going to have to take down quite a lot of trees. As Mary said, we had a discussion out on site and they're open to at least trying to save some over here that are far enough away from the house that they, they wouldn't be in the way of, um, of, the, of construction. Um, so I leave the rest of that open to you. I, I th it's, it felt like the wetland, I didn't take a really good look at the wetland delineation, but it looked about right to me. Um, I don't really have anything else to to say about, 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 about right now. I think, I think you guys can just do some questions. I might just share some of the pictures while the questions are happening of when we were out there yesterday. Okay. Um, uh, Ken, do you have any questions at this point? Um, no, I took a drive by there today. Um, I think the improvement at the infiltration is good because that's an upset improvement over what's there now. Um, just, just curious. Just curious on the trees, like how many trees would they be taken down? Yeah, could, that's a good question. Could you, uh, could someone from your team comment on which trees are being preserved and which ones are not, or which, what's being cleared, just to clarify? Sure. Um, if we can imagine in our minds the site plan that Eileen had up before, there was a dashed line showing uh, the limit of lawn area. Uh, I, I will go back to that. I was just going to say from this view here, you can see where the blue tape is. I don't know if you guys can see what I'm, what I'm doing. There's a blue tape. So all of the trees behind that line are coming down, but I'll, 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 I'll switch over. You can keep talking, Mary. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, in any case, all of the trees within the dashed line, which uh, begins at the Northern property line and then travels around counterclockwise over to Scott Road will likely be taken down. 
Um, there are some significant sized trees in that area, but the pines that dominate that canopy uh, really are not conducive to a foundation and a footing that most of the trees that we're taking down um, have conflict with either the infiltration systems that we're proposing or the footings or the foundation. And as I noted before, the trees in the southeast corner, we are going to try and preserve, particularly those along Scott Avenue. There is no clearing anticipated outside the limit of long line. And again, there are many large trees in that area as well. We are proposing to call the piles of brush, leaves, and garbage that currently run approximately along the edge of the stone wall. Um, and there are a few down trees that will either be cut and laid on the ground or, or taken out. The intent not being to create a park or a manicured area, but just to clean up woodlands that have been neglected for a long period of time. The shed that's shown in Eileen's pictures right now will also be coming down. And you can see there's a bunch of garbage and debris right behind the shed, but there's also uh, pieces of old equipment that must have been left there at some point in the past that have just rusted in place. Right. Okay, good. Th thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Jennifer, do you have anything on this one? On this one? Um, yeah, I'm just interested to hear feedback from the other commissioners um, about what their thoughts are on taking all those trees down and the impact that that will have in the area and if we should require uh, more plantings or replacing the trees in other areas to mitigate that loss. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's, uh, I have some thoughts on it, but let's go to the other commissioners. That's a subject. If you hadn't brought it up, I might have brought it up. Very good. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Ed, you, you, you were there. Uh, you have any comments? I think in relation to the tree cuttings, um, we still have a lot of trees that will remain. Uh, this is a real wooded area, and I think that'll complement what's gonna happen with the construction of this home. Uh, but outside that dotted line, as Mary was relating to, there's still a number of trees that are, are pretty good trees. We defined some ones, some of the trees were bad, uh, and some of the ones that should be saved within that area also. Uh, and the very top side of where you saw that house in the graphic, uh, there's also some trees that they're leaving fairly close to the line uh, where the construction of the house is. So they are, I think, contemplating making sure that things stay where they are right now without having to cut them down. Um, so I think that in that area I'm referring to is up at the top or 148.31. Uh, there was some trees that kind of hit that corner up there, which do stay. Um, so I was, I was pleased overall with, you just can't take as many trees down as you would like, because you'd be at it all day long. There's cutting trees. There's a lot of trees in there. Uh, so I think the plan is a good plan. The house is a good layout and the drainage and everything discussed, uh, should be well, uh, conducive to what they want to do there. All right, Bill. Bill, Bill can't, can't hear, hear you yet. Thank you. I, I was muted. Um, this has always been one of my favorite lots in town. I always found it to be uh, very interesting. It was a, it looked like a hidden camp on the woods on basically a hidden street in town, uh, totally incongruous for the neighborhood, uh, but strangely comforting to drive by. That would that that's the way I always felt. Uh, it, it just didn't belong there. It probably did a few years ago, but now so much has changed around it. Um, so I'm not surprised to see that it is time for it to be uh, modernized. Um, the I, question I have, of course, reducing the debris, even if you have to go into the no disturb area to do that, I think that's essential. So that's a good, a good uh, improvement. Um, what is the actual footprint dimensions of the house? I, I didn't get see that anywhere. I'm just curious. Um, let's see. 42 by, it's about uh, 42 by 45. That's the foundation. Okay, so that's not as big as some of the behemoths I see going in around town. 
Uh, no. Is it uh, two and a half stories as usual or? Yeah, two and a half story home, yeah. Okay, and is it a garage under? No, no, it's not under, it's a garage uh, on, on grade. So where is the garage? Is that in front? Right, right, yeah, right where the driveway is on the right side as you go into the lot, that's okay. the garage will be right there. So that's actually a garage, a room over? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, so that increases the effective footprint. I, I didn't picture that as a garage. I was picturing that as only a driveway. Uh, yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I see there are two infiltration chambers. Are they both just accepting portions of the runoff from different parts of the roof? Yeah, so there's there's two uh, systems, but there's actually 11 chambers total. So it's 11 plastic okay, yeah, yeah. storm tech chambers. Yeah, yeah, and so the whole roof will be going to those to those chambers. Okay, so it's just split somehow, one yeah. to one and one to the other. Um, yeah, I'm in terms of the cutting of the trees. Uh, if you've heard me speak at all, you know that I am a tree fan, and I hate to see them go. On this particular site, I don't see any logical place to plant replacement trees because it is so heavily wooded. Uh, I wish there were a tree ordinance of some sort that we could require you to put them somewhere else in town in compensation. We don't have that authority to require that. So, um, so I think what you have proposed is, is about as we can, as good as we can hope for for this. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, uh, is there, uh, the driveway is sloped from what 174 to 173.8. Is that is that what you have on there? For, for the yeah, level? yeah, it's, it's a fairly. Less, I think it's about three percent slope, so it's fairly level, but it'll drain. Okay, is there sufficient documentation for construction that it will come out that way, or do you need spot grades on that? Um, no, we'll we'll make sure to grade it to drain to the uh, stone trench. I think that that's how we normally do it. Right, right. I just sometimes See, we'll the only reason that. I ask sometimes we get the building as constructed, the driveway doesn't quite look as intended. If you know what I mean, it's not. It's not much to the right to the way. Right way. Uh, okay, if that's if sufficient. That's, that's fine. Uh, could you? Uh, we talked when we were on site about a, at least a couple of trees in the southeast corner that we thought could be saved. Could we mark those trees in the field? Uh, yes, they're going to be Okay. Okay. And, and uh, uh, Bill, uh, I took a critical look at uh, the wetlands. There is an open area in sort of the middle there that I pointed to that it looks like one or two trees could be, could be worthy of uh, providing shade in there. So could we ask you folks to, right uh, to, uh, uh, propose some trees that you think would fit in to that area? Yeah, I think that when we, we agreed was that, that there okay. was at least one optimal spot right. over towards the wetland edge that could take a good tree. And I suspect right. there's at least one other, um, maybe to yeah. the rear of the dwelling. Yeah, so could you, between now and the next meeting, could you just simply propose what you think? I think we're in agreement. It's just so we have documentation for the record. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, let's see. Um, and we also agreed that the that tree in that southeast corner that sort of came up with three or four branches overlooks the street and stuff like that. That the utility company may want to take that down anyway. Is that? Well, yeah. I I, I think they. Eventually, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so let's see if there's anyone else. Uh, I get one more any... question, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes. Uh, now that I realize that there is a garage there, I just uh, what's the how is the garage rooftop runoff that portion of the house is that going back to those chambers as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It'll all be it'll all be plumbed back to those chambers. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so is there anyone in the audience who is an interested party or an adjacent homeowner that would like to ask a question or make a comment? Uh, Andrea, is your hand up for this project? Uh, yeah, how you doing? Um, Great, I'm doing fine, thank you. <laughs> um, love you guys. Um, happy Easter thank for you. whoever celebrates. Um, Same to you. 
several of my neighbors in this area um, are of affordable that they're in Florida. I'm here. So I'm the representative for the Kinney Ave, Scott Ave area. Um, I have a couple of questions. I have submitted paperwork and photos, but I don't know if they were uploaded and Eileen helped me out here. We've chatted a few times, Eileen. Yep. Did you get any of the photos I sent about the back of number three? We, we got photos you sent, I think it was I think either today or yesterday, but I'm not sure where you, where you mean about uploading them. Well, I just, do you see the pictures of what we have in our backyards? I, I, I saw the ones you sent today. Okay. So guys. Can you describe it to us? I, um, I'll try and find them. Um, a slope from Taylor yes. Ave down, Scott Ave and Kinney into a swamp. Murray Garage at 22. Andrea, what is your address? Oh, for the, for the, Andrea, what is your address for the record, please? Andrea Tracy for Kinney Avenue. Okay, for Kinney Ave, got it. Okay. Representing three and five and seven and whatever. Okay. Okay. Uh, they're on vacation, so um, Eileen, you've been great. We chatted a few times, right? Yep. This is this is one of the photos that you sent yesterday. No, that's of backyards that are swampy in, that during the rainstorm have everybody in our neighborhoods with some pumps. That is the back of three and five Kinney, and that's a budding 10 Scott app. Mm -hmm. I want to take a second and recognize Bob O'Hagan that lived at Scott app. Okay, great mm -hmm. neighbor. Don't know the whole situation. Yesterday, there was a bunch of people grabbing crap out of the house. I know it's going to be torn down, but my problem is Bob O'Hagan's house was built in the 50s. We all built around him. The water table has changed drastically. Mm -hmm. Everybody at the lower part of this neighborhood is some pumping. What do they call it? 365, 24 seven? Sure. I understand that Murray bought the property and can do what he wants. This would be a great, what did you guys just talk about? Community Preservation Act? Well, okay. Am, am I just saying the right words? Yeah, you are. This is a wetland. It's been a wetland. It's It's got skunk grass like two weeks ago. We were back there and there's, there's raccoons, there's fox, there's turkey, there's everything. We don't have a lot of open space in this neighborhood. We have this and we have the top of Taylor Ave that Murray wants to build on. I don't want him putting condos on every spot of grass in our neighborhood. He has enough to do. We're already some pumping guys in this neighborhood. It's ridiculously wet. The slope from Taylor Ave down Scott Ave, it, it's gotta be more than 12% grade easily. And what we're asking is don't make it worse. We understand he owns a property, build a house. He wants to build two houses. Um, and that's gonna clear out every tree in that in that area that already has hawks and eagles daily. Put them up, put them uphill. Don't put them tight down to lot three. Put them on the uphill side if you have to build something. But I want to ask, where's the drainage going? The roof runoff from the garages of these three, you know, freaking garage, five bedroom houses. Where's the drainage going? We're already 
some pumping. What are we going to do next when you're adding all of this? That's all. I just, my neighbors are on vacation. They left me. I sent John and Eileen pictures of what it looks like. It can be dry, but it when it rains, it's, it's not considered a stream by my Northeastern University standards. It's intermittent. I get it. But when it rains, you're you're from Taylor Ave down. That's going to be like a twelve percent grade. The problem is Scott Ave is a paper street. It's not a legal street. Murray already built two more houses, plus one other guy retrofitted, and then there's a, a ranch. So there's already one, two, three, four. He wants to put two more houses. When when do we ask him to put drainage? There are no storm drains on that street. When do you ask him you want to add? You guys said, oh, it's one more house. It's not one more house. It's one more house in addition to five others. The bottom of the hill, all the water comes down Scott Ave. It goes around the corner and deposit in front of 22 Murray Ave and three Kinney Ave. These people are getting flooded. I'm done. And Andrea, hold on a second. Uh, I'd like them for some comment on this. Uh, uh, David, could you comment on two things? One is, we're here to talk about 10 Scott Ave. Could you comment on the location of the relative topography of where this lot is located compared to the other lots in the area? Because I think it's on the downside. I think that's the case, but maybe you have more specific comments. Could you, could you comment on that, David? And then the second comment is, could you comment on how the water is handled on the existing lot and what you're proposing to do to change that. I think I think that would be helpful if you commented on those two things. Yeah, sure. Um, so right now the lot, uh, this what's considered lot two, there's actually a lot between this lot and the uh, and Murray Avenue actually. There's a, there's a small there, a uh, small lot, uh, Murray Hill zones that's, that separates Murray, Murray Ave from this lot. Uh, nonetheless, yeah, this lot, is just above the wetland there that's been spoken about and the intermittent stream. So this house is essentially at the bottom of the uh, of the watershed there. Um, and as we stated before, this existing house and driveway right now didn't have any any way to handle the runoff. So any of that runoff went sheet flow wherever it uh, happened to go, which which was toward the wetland. So now though, we are going to actually collect the runoff on the roof and infiltrate it into the ground. Uh, same thing with the driveway. So we should be, again, reducing runoff off the site. Um, so you shouldn't see any surface flow coming off this site like you do right now at present. So that should be alleviate uh, some of that uh, concern of the, uh, for this, this watershed, which I understand is is uh, down at the bottom there at Murray at Murray Ave. So again, I, I don't think we're going to make the problem worse. I think if anything, we're going to improve uh, conditions with the uh, with our proposal. I'd like to also comment that the um, for the record, this is Mary Trudeau speaking. The houses on Kinney Road who have the sump pumps are discharging onto this lot, and and the flows are going into that wetland system. Uh, I think there were photos included in the notice of intent of what I was calling the intermittent stream, but I believe that it's fed by a sump pump. Um, I agree that those two lots, at least three and five, have quite a bit of standing water in their yards as it is, but the discharges that occur come onto this property, go into the wetlands, and then pass beneath Murray Ave. Okay, so essentially, uh, the some pump, some pump and pump runoff pump. from those two properties on Kinning are being deposited in or near that wetland. Exactly. 
I see. I see. We, are we are handling their runoff. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Which, Which, in some respects, I suppose is good for them. If they got a place for their water to go. Not for us. <laughs> Not for you, but it's good for them. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Are there, this is Ed. Uh, Mary and I did walk right in that area because it was a lot of nice green growth that's also started there. Um, it follows that fence right on down for dividing the two properties of Kinney and, and Ten Scott. And it didn't look like it's a major flow of water, but obviously dry right now and just waits for wet, wet rainstorms or something to happen for that to fill up at any rate. But I don't think it's going to be heavy because it's not really deep. Uh, where we have a heavy runoff, um, but I, I really see it as something that's happening from other properties that just follows that fence line right down to the wetlands. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, would anyone like to further comment, Andrea? Did you have additional comments? Uh, yes. Um, so we have neighbors, and they have some pumps because we're flooding. Mm -hmm. okay. So. Where do you put the water? You pump it out onto your own property. Well, right oh, now, right. apparently three, th three and five kinney, kinney are pumping it on someone, someone else's, else's property, property, it looks like. like. But it's, you're pumping it to your backyard. It's infiltrating in the backyard. Right. It's, not, so it's infiltrating it, to the backyard. And it's flowing onto oh, 10 square oh, Ave. I mean, it will be in the future. That's what I mean. Which yeah. is a low spot along the whole property line. Yeah. You're now proposing this is one property you're talking about, 10 Scott Ave. <clears throat> Agree. Murray is going to put two more houses above this on a slope. Take all the trees down. We're going to have more water. Where do you put the water, Mary? If you're some pumping, you can pump to your own property, Mary? We, we're not proposing a sump pump. We're proposing stormwater mitigation in the form of infiltration systems on our own lot. All of our roof runoff will be directed to these underground systems, which will then move vertically through the water column, um, entering the groundwater system. You may see some emergence down at the wetland system, which is how groundwater usually travels parallel to the surface yeah. contours. Okay. Um, right now, the bulk of the standing water on this lot is from the Kinney Ave properties that they are discharging their sumps. One house appears to run overland across their lawn. The second house de deposits their water into a trench, which leads directly onto this property and into the wetland system. So we are mitigating for the high groundwater situation that's being experienced by the neighbors, and that won't change in the future. The wetland capacity will be retained. We're not doing any work within 25 feet of it. So if there is additional discharge from the Kinney Road properties, the room exists in that wetland to accommodate it. My question is, Scott Ave is a paper street. It's not a legal street. It has no drainage. It has no storm drains. It's not legally wide enough. It's owned by Murray Properties Real Estate. He's He built two houses below. The existing property upland from that it enlarged. So you got one, two, three, four on the um, southern side of Scott Ave. Mm -hmm. And now you want to propose this house and Murray wants an additional house. So what I'm asking is one, two, three, four, five, it's six houses. When do we legally ask them to make it street legal and 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 do the drainage the right way? Bob well, Hagen now, was well, now, 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 now we're getting beyond the law, unfortunately. unfortunately. Uh, Regarding the status of the street, is that the engineering department typically? The uh, status of the street is listed in the town as a private way in public use. Uh, therefore, a building permit for a lot may be applied for and received. Obviously, he built, Mr. Murray right. built the three, two houses across the street, on, also on Scott Avenue. Right. So it's a private way in public use. All right, but that's not. 
which gives legal frontage to those laws. All right, but that is not an issue for the commission. What we're here to do is to see how the existing water is and how they're proposing to handle the additional water that would run off to avoid either going into the street or into someone else's property. And that, that's what's actually being discussed here. Uh, now, I recognize, Andrea, that you may have problems with the status of the street, you've said. You may have, you may have problems with water in the area. Uh, water that's currently there, you're going to add more. Well, they're, they're actually, actually proposing to infiltrate it so there'll be less water running off the property. And in fact, if the, uh, the folks who are contributing sump pump water and water from their basement from Kinney Ave, if they were not doing that, that wetland may not exist and we may not even be having this hearing, to be honest with you. So, sump pump water, it, it needs to be discharged to your own property, Larry? I, 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 could, can we repeat the question? Some pump water needs to be discharged onto your property. Right, they're right. discharging it to a low area, but it's running onto their property is my understanding of what's happening. Is that correct? It's, it's five feet away from the property line. Right. The, the, the storm drains, the gutters, everything. I think, I think the people, the people on Kenny Ave are probably delighted that it's going off of their property and going somewhere else. Well, we've tried to get Murray to upgrade his storm scepters at 22 at the warehouse because that is a low spot of this whole neighborhood downhill. But the biggest problem is Scott Ave is a paper street, Murray Ave is a paper street. Yeah, we can't, we, we, can't, can't help. Help we, your Andrea, we, can, we can't help you with that. That is something for to take up with both the engineering department and boards. I know we just don't handle that. I'm sorry. We tried that. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry that Mr. O'Hagan's property is not going to be there. He was a really nice guy. I want to give a moment. Okay. To okay. Remember him. All right. Very good. Okay. Uh, let me let me move on for a second and see. Is there anyone else who has a comment on? for the hearing at 10 Scott Ave. Do you folks, are you here for that? Do you here for 10 Scott Ave? Yes. Would you like to say anything? Oh, no, we just uh, received this uh, notice and we, we want to see what exactly is happening. We, All right. We we the uh, okay. Do you have any questions at this point? No. Okay, well, the hearing will be continued to April 28th and you can come back at that time and in the meantime if you have questions you could be even before then you could forward them to the office yep. and you know either they will try to answer or get it to people who can't answer you okay yeah. all right uh all right is there anyone else who would like to say something new about this project so, Jim, I have one more question. Yes. yes um is the new house planning to install a sump pump? And if so, where will it be discharged? No, I, I don't believe we are planning to do a sump pump, no. Okay, I just wanted to see what you were doing if you were, so show an example of how it should be done, I hope. Thank you. Right. Well, right, I do so, want to, if I could reiterate that we are handling our own runoff on site, and, yes. and that's that's what we're required to do, that's the law. So we are doing what we are required to do, so thank you. Right. And that, that I think is important. Uh, I know, Andrew, you have a lot of other concerns about other properties and streets and everything else, but our authority here is to make sure that the work done on this particular property does not increase the flow, volume, or rate off of the property. It can only make it better. So, and that's what this design is planned to do. So, and that's, that's the limit of our authority. Uh, unless someone has something new to offer, what I see as a summary is that you're going to uh, uh, mark the trees in the field that will be saved, that a few that we talked about. Yes. Uh, and obviously, maybe you can take another review of any other trees that might qualify. I didn't see any, we didn't talk about any, but perhaps you could take another look. We can look again. Right, of course. 
uh, and they'll mark them in the field. And then should they be marked on the plan as well at all? I don't know that it's really necessary if they're marked in the field. Yeah, Eileen, is that okay? Um, I don't think the individu individual trees necessarily need to be marked, but uh, you, you could, you could ma pictures. maybe just, you know, change the limit of work to kind of loop around the, the spot where we're trying to catch them, uh, save a few, you know what I'm saying? I guess so. Just so that it's... Does that make a difference? Um, we did that. <clears throat> it would make that limit of work a little yeah, bit smaller. Okay, uh, and uh, you're going to take a look at, make a proposal where you think some open areas are that would benefit from having some additional plantings. Uh, I think we sort of know, yeah. We, we'll, yes. yeah. you'll take a look at that and come with a recommendation. Yep. Okay, uh, is there, did anyone hear anything else that needs to be done before the next continuation of the hearing? Uh, did you mention they're going to look for places to plant new trees? Yes. Yes, yes, we did. Yes. Okay. All right. So, could I have a motion to uh, continue the hearing for 10 Scott Ave to April 28th, um, 2022? So moved. Second? Anybody Any second? second? Okay. Can Ed, how do you vote? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Bill? Yes. Chair votes yes by a vote of 4-0-0. The public hearing on 10 Scott <laughs> Ave will be continued until the next meeting of the Conservation Commission on April 28th. Thank you. All right, you're entirely welcome. Thank you. All I'm right, th you thank you all for participating. Okay. All right. So, uh, continuing on with our agenda, uh, we have uh, a continued public hearing, Notice of Intent, 44 Westwood Street, MGW Realty, LLC, by Lenny Radokia. Uh, it is to demolish a dwelling and construct a new house. It has a DEP file number, 122-670. Okay, is there someone here for that project? Good evening. I'm Rich Kirby from LEC Environmental Consultants. How are you tonight? Very good. And yourself? Good, thanks. I'm here with uh, Lenny Radokia, and we're following up with the commission uh, for the raise and rebuild of the single family house at 44 Westwood Street. If the commission recalls, this is the house that had the 26 foot uh, depth uh, to it, and it was slightly in the front yard setback, and we rotated it just a bit to get it outside of the front yard setback. Uh, we had roughly 3,300 square feet of wetland and buffer zone restoration in, in the back. We were reducing impervious area by about 885 square feet, I believe it was. And of course, having a front facing garage, which shortened the driveway. So the, the expansion of the house is effectively over the existing driveway. Well, at the last hearing, um, you know, John Keeley had talked a little bit about the, the commission's, um, uh, how they look at projects like this, and sometimes they'll take into consideration some structures, auxiliary structures that are actually closer to the wetland. Of course, in this case, we actually have uh, a shed in the wetland, uh, another shed within the 25 foot uh, buffer zone. And so after the last hearing, um, Lenny met with his architect to say, look, am I really gonna be able to design a modern house with a 26 foot depth? And the architect said, it's be extremely difficult to do so. So in light of the discussions at the last hearing, um, we went back to the drawing board and what we're proposing is to expand the house portion of this structure. We'll leave the, we'll leave the garage the way it was and the two foot cantilever the way it <coughs> Was, but the house portion, we're asking for another four feet off the rear of the house. Now, we had presented this to uh, John Keeley and he had asked the question, well, what else can you provide for mitigation? And I recall that the last hearing, there was discussion about the driveway. And so what we did was we've modified the paved driveway to a pervious paver driveway. So now, even though we're increasing the, the size of the house by four feet off the back, we're actually reducing impervious surface with the entire site 
by roughly 1,250 square feet. I think it's 1,251 instead of 885. So we're, when we're still keeping the 3,290 square feet of wetland and buffer zone restoration, we're still infiltrating stormwater. Uh, we still have the fence to demarcate the restored area, but we are asking for a bit of a latitude with respect to the depth of the house in light of the additional mitigation that we're proposing. So with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions that the commission may have or, and talk about it some more. Okay, good. Thank you for that summary. Uh, Eileen. I have some comments on the status of the project. Um, well, as, as, as Rich just described, it, it is a slightly bigger house than you were presented with um, two weeks ago at the last meeting. Um, I do, you know, there, it's coming four feet closer to the wetland than the existing house. However, as I think we all agreed, they're, they're doing, they're proposing a really nice job of restoring the wetland and restoring and, and minimizing the size of, of the lawn. It's a very, very tight lot. Um, and I like the fact that they've put, they've, they've made it impervious driveway. I think that's, uh, that'll be a really nice thing to show off to, to, to other people. You know, it can be done. Um, so yes, it's 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 a tight lot. So I think they've really they've they've done pretty much what they can with this, and I I, I, I don't have I, I don't have an issue with you. You don't have additional issues. I don't. Okay. All right. Uh, regarding the last thing, we talked about having some spot grades for the for the driveway or something. Did that ever get done? Well, we were going to have some spot grades for the driveway because at the time of that discussion, the driveway was going to be paved and we right. talked about having a stone trench along the right side of that. Right, so you don't need it now. Correct. Yeah, yeah, now that it's all uh, poor, right. uh, sorry, permeable pavers, all of that washed stone will be underneath the, um, the pavers of the driveway. So we don't yeah, need I, the stone. Right, right. I realized the answer to the question as I was asking it, <laughs> unfortunately, but the question was already out there. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, and, uh, and therefore you don't need a trench along the driveway either. That's right. That's right. It would really be redundant because you got that one right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's something about you had to speak to DPW about an easement. Oh yes, they did. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure uh, how much progress Jack made about the easement. I can tell you the the primary question had to do with this catch basin that was in the front yard here, the right. bottom right corner of the plan. And uh, Lenny looked at that a little bit more closely, popped the grate, and there's only a single pipe headed back toward the street. So what we suspect is that is an overflow for the if the if the drainage in the street surcharges, it's going to overflow from that great from that catch basin and then flow over land toward the the wetlands in the rear uh-huh do you, you think that's what, that, is that what do you need an easement for that at all well i don't know who put it in if the town put it in i suppose perhaps an easement should have been sought i don't know if one has been or not i but, think we wondered if it was a yard drain which was actually taking water from the yard into the storm drain system which which was why they had asked you to see if you could remove it yeah um it, it we'd have to look at the um the elevation of that grate uh, and the elevation of the um sorry the inlet and the outlet for the pipes to figure out which what is the direction of flow my only thought about that is I, there really is no watershed for i mean the only way water could get to that catch basin is if the the wetland water flooded so much that it went all the way up to the street, which I think is pretty unlikely. <clears throat> At that so point, the, the house, the house that would be surrounded by water, the existing house. Um, yeah, so, so, well, that, that's, that's all the issues that we had from last time. Is there anything new? It's going to be capturing a lot of the water. What do we need to do here regarding the catch basin? Anything further or just? Um, I, I think we could leave it alone. Um, they're they're going to be capturing a lot of the water now from all the impervious surfaces, or in fact, they won't even be impervious surfaces for in terms of the driveway. I I, th I think it, I think we can leave it as is. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see if there's anything else. We'll go to the commissioners and see if anyone else is in the audience. Um, Kent, anything more on this one? Excuse me. Um, Jennifer, anything more? No, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. All right, Ed, anything else? 
I don't see anything to add to it. Uh, just a four feet change and everything with the driveway. I think it's all, all plus marks. All right, uh, Bill, anything further? Uh, yeah, I agree. The uh, actual reduction in total impervious area, even though the house is increased, is a positive. Uh, there's still a lot of restoration of resource area. I did have one question about the driveway. The text that was submitted says, and I quote, the plan also <coughs> retains the stone trench along the edge of the forest pavement driveway as a redundant measure. Uh, oh, right. I, I, I did not disagree with that because yeah. the forest paveways can sometimes work less efficiently with age or whatever. So I thought that was a pretty good idea, actually. Well, I, I skipped a part of the story because <laughs> when we first went back to John, we actually had a porous pavement driveway, oh. which is different from the pervious pavers. Okay. And John had said he doesn't like porous pavement because right. it just takes one homeowner to seal it, to seal coat it when it doesn't look, you know, nice and jet black. And now it's no longer uh, pervious. <laughs> So that's why we went from uh, porous pavement to pervious pavers. When we okay, had the porous pavement different. driveway, we were going to keep that um, stone apron, but now that we have the pervious pavers, we don't need it. Okay, thank you. Okay, I agree. Uh, and I do not have anything further on this. For anyone in the audience, uh, a neighbor or someone else concerned with the project that has a comment or a question. Okay, the record should show there's no one in the audience for this. So we have some draft uh, documents uh, to consider voting on. We do, and um, Lenny, I just want to say I'm sorry I did not actually, I didn't, I hope Rich or uh, Jack sent it on to you because I, I inadvertently didn't include you when I sent them out earlier. Yeah, I forwarded it to Jack. Yeah. Thank and you. I took a look at them and, and they have been available to reasonable. Okay, so, so, so she's, she's Eileen, I'll ask Eileen to review it and she'll go through it quickly and but if there's any questions or something on your mind, you, you know, you'll have an opportunity to say something. Just one change. It says uh, it's going to be closed at the April 14, 2024 hearing. It should be 2022. Maybe I'm looking at their own Sorry, one. where? Oh, under the, I think it was the proposed docu center. Uh. Oh, I see where you're saying it, down the bottom. Yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> good catch, good catch. I see where it is, it's under filing history. Yep. Okay, so, catch. yeah, uh, let me just filing history. Uh, you know what, I think, I think I can do that right now. 22. Uh, notice of intent to by wetland bylaw application was filed for the demolition of ex an existing single family residence deck <laughs> driveway picnic table on a concrete slab, retaining wall, and two sheds and removal of one tree and construction of a new single family dwelling deck walkway porous driveway retaining walls and associated grading and utilities and planting of 10 trees and 59 shrubs within bordering vegetated wetlands and the 100 foot buffer to bordering vegetated wetlands and riverfront of a locally regulated stream the filing history is described here that's where kent made the catch about that we're going to close in, in two years um, the, 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 the two plans are as, uh, well, sorry, one, one plan and then the wetland buffer zone mitigation plan. The proposed construction was within the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands and riverfront area. The closest point of the proposed new dwelling was approximately 13 feet from the BBW. One shed would be removed from the, within the BBW and restoration work would occur within the BBW. The existing house was 17 <coughs> feet from the wetland. The mean annual high water used to determine the riverfront area was delineated as required in the wetland regulations. The commission considers this stream to be the Ipswich River and thus, thus statutorily protected with the riverfront regardless of its perennial or intermittent status. The commission is voting to waive the 20 foot no disturb setback and 40 foot no bill setback because while the dwelling will be closer to the wetland than the existing dwelling, structures within the wetland and within the 20 foot no disturb setback would be removed and the wetland would be restored. The commission finds that the bordering vegetated wetland and riverfront area delineations are accurate. Um, it is exempt from the stormwater management regulations. However, they are uh, infiltrating um, all of the rooftop water and driveway water on site. Um, other findings was that the commission waived both no build and no disturb setbacks. The applicant found it difficult to comply with setback requirements to both property lines and BVW without extensive engineering and additional disturbance of the lot. 
The granting of a waiver for this project does not set a precedent as each application before the Commission shall be judged on its own merit. In this case, the applicant is restoring about 2,700 square feet of uh, wetland slash riverfront area and about nine, 590 square feet of buffer zone um, to BBW or riverfront area that was previously either maintained as lawn or contained structures. The applicant proposes to remove one shed in the wetland and one shed and one picnic table on a slab in the 20-foot no disturb area. The removal of these structures is an improvement as it is a restoration of the wetland lawn area, as is the restoration of the wetland lawn areas with the addition of 10 trees and 59 shrubs. The fence at the rear will allow a previously disturbed area to vegetate and will prevent future encroachment an extensive replanting plan will accelerate the restoration. And this will also serve as a permit under the Erosion and Sedimentation Control Bylaw. Um, all of the rest of these um, uh, descriptions are standard and we are proposing that a cash performance bond in the amount of 3500 be um, uh, submitted for this project. And the, the, and the last two of these are just standard about um, fines are possible if if, uh, if you don't do it right. Let me see if I can just switch directly over and we can still see the other, this, this we do. So again, it was the same two plot plans, our uh, mitigation plans are referenced in the uh, order of conditions. The first several conditions are standard, no work, this order permits work within the 100 foot, foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands. Uh, sc strolling down, scrolling down to pre-construction conditions. Um, this is standard. Um, Rich is very well aware of this. We require um, a notification before work starts. Um, the work area shall be staked and marked in the field. Uh, you should put up your erosion controls and uh, provide us with evidence that the order has been filed at the Registry of Deeds and the surety has been paid and your sign displaying the DEP number shall be posted in a visible location. Erosion controls shall be installed along the erosion control line as shown, so shown in the reference plan. Sediment barriers should be hay bales and sediment filter fabric. This is very, very close to the wetland, so I would, we would prefer hay bales. But you can use um, wattles, nine, minimum nine inches across the frontage on Westwood Street. Materials shall not be stockpiled on the site within 20 feet of wetlands. No dewatering on this site without uh, a, a, an approved plan. Uh, sweep the sediment from the street uh, um, daily if any tracking is evident. Um, we will require silt sacks in uh, the nearest catch basins and we may, we may require additional erosion control. Work involving filling and grading is, uh, is just, just says yeah, no, no additional filling and grading shall be allowed without coming back to us for permission. Pollution control and refueling is all completely standard. Um, and no, no refueling um, any, anywhere near a wetland, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides shall not be used within 100 feet of wetlands. And that condition shall be noted on the certificate of compliance as existing in perpetuity. Rooftop runoff shall be infiltrated on site as shown on the plan. Porous pavers with crushed stone in the gaps shall be used to construct the driveway. If the porous pavers are replaced with impervious material, that driveway shall drain to a stone trench or vegetated swale and uh, those shall be maintained in perpetuity. A post and rail fence shall be installed in front of the wetland across the rear of the lot. Um, in most of this area, it's actually gonna be almost on top of the wetland because it's just su such a tight lot. The new fence shall not have gates and the demarcation shall be maintained in perpetuity. 10 native trees and 59 native shrubs shall be planted. Uh, they shall be monitored through two full growing season seasons and shall be replaced if they're not thriving. No occupancy permit sign-off shall occur before establishment of the trees and shrubs. Um, everything else behind the fence must be left um, at, then as natural, and that shall be no noted in the, in the COC as existing in perpetuity. And the shed in the wetland shall be removed by hand only if that's feasible. The shed and picnic table on slab in the 20-foot no disturb area shall be removed by hand or using a bobcat only. No heavy equipment shall be used behind the erosion control line. And these are just the, the, the requirements for how you go about getting a um, certificate of compliance. Okay, There's, there was a lot that she said, but many of it, much of it is routine. You can suspect that much of it is routine stuff. Uh, do you have any questions at this point at all? I need to talk to you. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I'm good, thank you. 
I mean, if you do, you can always, you know, you can always call the office anyway for any clarification or decision on anything anyway. So, but of course. Uh, all right, so I guess we can move ahead. Uh, uh, it looks like this project requires a waiver. Yes. All right, so I'd like to have a motion to uh, grant a waiver to both the no build and the no disturb uh, setback to the BBW uh, because it is justified because uh, the applicant proposes to remove one shed that's already in the BBW and one shed and one picnic table on a slab that's already in the 20 foot no disturb and is restoring restoration of the wetland lawn area with uh, 10 trees and 59 shrubs so it's justified on that basis and uh, the applicant is restoring 2,700 square feet of BVW riverfront area and 590 square feet of buffer zone. So for all of those reasons, I think the commission could consider the waiver, uh, a motion to waiver as being justified for this particular circumstance. Is there such a motion? We'll move it. Second. <coughs> All right, Jennifer, how do you vote on the waiver? Yes. Ed? Yes. Uh, Bill? Yes. All right, and the chair votes yes, so by a vote of 4-0-0, the waiver for this project to the no disturb zone and uh, the no build setback zone is granted. All right, so could I have a motion to uh, close the hearing for, okay? And this is for, uh -huh. okay, and this was for DEP mm -hmm. file number 122-670, in case they want to note it in the record. Okay, so uh, it's been seconded. Jennifer, how do you vote on closing the hearing? Yes. Ed? Yes. Bill? Yes. And the chair is yes. Again, by a vote of 400, the hearing is closed. Next. Uh, could I have a motion to adopt the findings for DEP file number 122-670 under Burlington Bylaw Article 14? Mm -hmm. Second? Second. Okay. Again, Jennifer. Yes. Ed, adopt the findings. Yes. Bill? Yes. The chair votes yes, same vote by a vote of 400, the findings are adopted. Could I have a motion to adopt the order of conditions under both Burlington Bylaw Article 14 and the State Wetlands Protection Act for DEP file number 122-670? So moved. Second. Second, Bill. Okay, Jennifer, how do you vote? Yes. Ed? Ed. And Bill? Yes. And again, the chair votes yes by a vote of 400. The order of conditions uh, for DEP file number 122 670 for 44 Westwood Street is approved. Could I have a motion to require the posting of $3,500 surety under authority of Burlington Bylaw Article 14 for DEP file number 122 670 for a project located at 44 Westwood Street? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Do we need any discussion on this? Anyone? No. All right. Uh, Ed, how do you vote? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Bill? Yes. And the chair votes yes by a vote of 400. The uh, request for the applicant to post a $3,500 surety for 44 Westwood Street for DEP phone number 122-670 is approved. Gentlemen, I think your project is ready to go from our point of view. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate the time and effort uh, in reviewing it and for your consideration. And we appreciate your cooperation in getting this successfully permitted. Thank you again. All right, have a good night, everybody. Yeah, have, have a good night, folks. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, uh, next on the agenda uh, is we're going to skip down to 
planning board comments. Do we have anything for the planning board? No. no. Do we have any subcommittee and staff no. reports or updates? Uh, I do. Anyone else? Okay, uh, just for the commission's reference, uh, you many, most of you don't know this, I participated in a meeting that was called by Paul, Eileen and I participated in a meeting that was called by Paul Sagarino, uh, John Sanchez, and Tom Hayes. It was a, it was a meeting uh, offered to get together with the residents of Hilltop Drive, I guess, and Sandy Brook Road. Uh, and the subject was flooding. It was not only just flooding, it's flooding that has gotten worse, that has been spreading into their, uh, their yards and even in, in a real bad storm, probably into their homes, uh, into their driveways, into the garages and so forth. And they have noted, as you may all suspect, that uh, the, the situation has gradually been getting worse as time has gone on. There's a few reasons for that that were noted during the discussion. Uh, the reasons are, of course, as we all know, the intensity and amount of water coming down from the sky as rain is getting worse. So, for example, a 24-hour, 100-year storm used to be rated at 7 inches in 24 hours is now rated at, what, 8.9? More like 9. More yeah. like 9 inches in 24 hours, so that's like a 25 or 30 percent increase in the amount of water at this point from what had been established, and it's supposed to get worse. Second of all, there's been a the the I, the area on Sandy Brook is a I was noted is an ideal. It's absolutely perfect beaver habitat, and apparently the word has gotten out to the beavers, and they know it. <laughs> And uh, so what happens is the, the town has been running, trying to run an active uh, either trapping or breaching of beaver dams. I'm not sure if it's one or both, but they've been trying to deal with this issue. Uh, and the residents felt that it was not sufficient. Uh, they wanted more done. They weren't entirely sure how much more could be done, but they know they wanted more done. Uh, and uh, Tom Haynes made a formal presentation to them, and during this presentation, he made note of the fact that that uh, uh, that the slope between Hilltop Drive all the way to the gristmill where the water discharges in Bedford, the change in elevation is only eight feet. Over a two-mile run, that is not a lot of slope. Okay, and so. In other words, the slope of the river system uh, from Hilltop Drive all the way through and into Vine Brook and all the way in uh, is something like the, the thickness of a credit card per foot. That's how small it is, and it's not enough to make water run. So these people were initially asking, how about let's dredge it? Well, the problem is dredging only works if you have a sufficient slope for the water to run to. In this case, it's almost completely flat, so it doesn't. Furthermore, there have been two studies, one in 1979 and one in year 2000, 21 years later. They both found the same thing. When it rains a lot, there is a backwater effect, okay, from Vine Brook. Vine Brook essentially is backing up Long Meadow and Sandy Brook. So the water, because it is backing up, the water can't run from Long Meadow and Sandy Brook into Vine Brook because the water is actually backing up in the other direction and it's filling. And so what that causes is the groundwater level to rise. So the groundwater that we would like it to around Sandy Brook and Hilltop to drain into Vine Brook has no place to go. So the bottom line is uh, dredging is not going to help matters whatsoever. And in fact, because it destabilizes the banks and so forth, uh, essentially causes a higher sediment load to be deposited in places that cause problems. So their idea or uh, their suggestion of why don't we just dredge it is just simply not feasible. There are other things wrong with it because it would require a permit from the Wetlands Protection Act. It is not permittable 
to destroy that length of bank and stream underwater. It's not the reason why we didn't talk about this much because if it's not feasible, it's not feasible. <clears throat> but the fact is, if it was feasible, we would try to permit it and the commission would, under the regulations, would probably have to deny it. The, the uh, proponents, the neighborhood, would then go for an appeal to us uh, for a superseding order. DEP would have to deny it. So if they wanted to go further, they'd have to engage a lawyer and try to get a waiver from the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs. Uh, and the chances of being successful with that, given the parameters of such a project, again, would probably be a failure for them, but we don't know. Uh, it also requires a Corps of Engineers permit, uh, which we didn't talk about much because of its infeasibility. And because they would have to there's no way to remove the dredge sp spoils as they would be dredging it. It has to be deposited on the bank, essentially destroying the habitat of the bank and so forth. And it probably has a very low probability of being supported. Uh, a 404 permit sometimes can be granted if you say there's a high mosquito count. But generally speaking, on a perennial stream, you don't have a high larvae count for mosquitoes. So it would not be permittable even that way either. Um, and then there'd be something called a 401 water quality certification. And when you're depositing dredge spoils onto a bank, it's pretty hard to meet the 401 water quality, the surface water standards. <coughs> Uh, so there's a lot of permitting issues, but we didn't talk about them with them because of the infeasibility of the project to begin with. Uh, so we, so Tom Hayes gave that presentation. Then there was some back and forth discussion with a lot of people talking about how they have terrible water problems and that have gotten worse. Uh, I got up and made some additional suge suggestions. Uh, I suggested that uh, <clears throat> one person said we need a place for the water to go and that's absolutely true. One place for the water to go is if the somehow the town took over four lots on Hilltop and four lots, you know, essentially buying them on, uh, on uh, Sandy Brook and essentially converted them into a wetland. That would provide substantially more room for the water to go, but I mean, you're talking about going to town meeting and, and having them authorize funds for such a project. And, you know, you know, what's fair market value when you're essentially destroying the houses that are on the lot and making a wetland? People paid good money for those homes. And so that's kind of a, a sticky issue for the homeowners. Uh, and the other thing we talked about which Eileen wasn't thrilled about that I said this, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> it was about, I said how under the Wetlands Protection Act that if they were to propose filling of a floodplain, <clears throat> it's allowable and can be considered by the commission if they find a place of equal elevation and volume to dig it out somewhere, but that place doesn't exist on their property. So that's another problem. I mean, theoretically, if we found a place where it could be dug out there, theoretically, they could build up their property and protect their particular home. But it's hard for a homeowner who doesn't have that room to dig out on their property or the unacceptable place to actually do that. So that's a summary. Do any of you folks have any questions <coughs> as you're listening to all this? It was not entirely, up. the people were pleasant enough, but they were upset and they want it to be listened to, which is, <coughs> is probably the only good thing that got accomplished. Yeah. But there weren't a lot of, there certainly wasn't an easy, significant solution for them that came out of it. The town... Yeah, the situation, I mean, it, you know, we see that in, in smaller places as well. I mean, people have water and they just want it to be somewhere else. And, if you're in the low-lying area, there is no other place for it to go. You know, that's part of the issue that and people expect that something must be done about it. But nature is nature, and you can't always overrule it. Right, right. And again, some people say, well, 
can't we, one person said, for example, can't we just essentially build levees and keep the water inside the channel? Okay, unfortunately, that's not entirely what's going on. What's going on is the groundwater is rising. It's not a, necessarily only a surface water flow from water overflowing the banks, which is what it looks like. What's happening is the water level from the backwater effect is rising. So it's a rather difficult situation for them. And uh, out there, uh, that's exactly what I was thinking too. That water table is rising no matter what you do. Right, right. So, I mean, is there any benefit and will the town possibly think it's worth hiring a consultant to look for areas where it could be dug out? I don't know if they would ever do that or not, but I mean, perhaps it might be worthwhile. I don't know, but but uh, right now there's there's certainly not an immediately obvious solution for these folks, and the bad news is their flooding issues in that area are likely to get worse over time. like that to get worse there and in other locations throughout town and one way to help fight it is to try to do everything you can to prevent you know fossil fuels usage and things of that nature and help control or at least limit the, the rate of uh, climate change yeah that's, that's not a fast fix that's for sure that's what you're trying to get to what would tr and what, it's not going to dry up their yards right now it's either. not going to dry up their yards it's going to if anything it might slow it getting worse Right. All right. Um, and in the end, people noted that as the town is being built up with these mega mansions, and some uh, proponents have an unusual uh, persuasion to removing trees. Mm -hmm. And then we have seen, you, you all know, we've seen people in town they have built a house and now their yard is flooded and they got a brand new house and they have puddles in their yard and they want to know what happened. Well, the, the 12 trees that were on their yard have been removed. That's part of what happened. Among other things. All right. Uh, any further comment from anyone? Uh, Kent, nothing. Uh, I took a few minutes to discuss this because I thought you folks would find that interesting and you weren't present at that meeting, so I wanted you to hear about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, so next on the agenda, other business. Do we have uh, anything else going on? Could, could, could we maybe just introduce Mimi? Would that be okay? She's actually on this call, and if she's open to saying hello, and she's interested in possibly... Um, maybe taking over Kent's position when he becomes a full member? As an associate. I, I think so. I don't I mean, know whether she wants we can to either, speak. We can actually have more than one, too. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's like, uh, Mimi, are you online? She may not be in a position to speak. I don't know. I, I did just put her on the spot there. <laughs> All right. Well, we can see that you're online. We, we welcome uh, you. I hope uh, you found our meeting interesting okay well she could feel free to reach out to one of us either staff or or you or bill um to chat some more sure absolutely okay and uh if you're interested in being an associate commissioner uh <laughs> you would have full <laughs> rights to participation you wouldn't be voting on things but you would have full rights to participation on every item on the agenda okay uh Next on the agenda, upcoming meetings, April 28th. And oh, 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 okay. I didn't. Very small. Yeah, Very small. Um, one I just found interesting uh, since the CPA was brought up tonight. The, um, you know, we talk about how the state trust fund is funded and it's done through real estate transactions. I learned recently that there are more than just purchases and sales that get a, uh, the fees attached anything filed, including things like certificates of compliance that are issued by a conservation commission. They have to be filed with the registry of deeds. They have a $50 fee that goes to the CPA fund. So I thought that was interesting since it related directly to the work that we do. 
And the other item I wanted to bring up was, uh, and I, I was going to say, let's talk about it tonight, but we have such a minimum attendance tonight. I'd rather do it when a bigger percentage of those who would be affected are, are present. Uh, I'd like to discuss changing the starting time of the meeting uh, as a general thing to 6.30 or even 6 o'clock, like many other uh, boards and commissions in town do. Uh, and I'd just like to get a feel for whether people would be interested in doing that. So maybe we can put that as a discussion item on the next meeting. Is your motivation, uh, Bill, that the older we get, we're starting <laughs> to run into our bedtime? <laughs> you read my mind, Larry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Bill. I won't. I won't comment on how old you are. Therefore, okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, is, is there anything further from anyone? Could I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? No. Second. Second. Jennifer, how do you vote? Yes. Ed. Yes. Bill. Yes. And the chair votes yes by a vote of 400. The April 4th, 2022 meeting of the Burlington Conservation Commission is now adjourned. Have a good night, everyone.